Today I want to talk about the testimony, the testimony of the covenant. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. God, I ask for your anointing to speak your word. Lord, make it alive, make it real, speak to our hearts, reveal yourself, reveal Christ. Be glorified, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, we know a lot about the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. And I want to look at that a little more closely, an aspect of that. And we find this in Exodus 16.34. Exodus 16.34, where God has given Aaron instructions to put the pot of manna into the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. And God, the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron, and as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Before the testimony. We know God told Moses to build the Ark of the Covenant, to build all the furnishings for the tabernacle. It was a tabernacle in the wilderness, and God's presence was there. It was actually his throne. And the most central part of it was the Holy of Holies. There were several parts, but the Holy of Holies was the most holy place. The only thing there was the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony. And it was a, a gold chest, hollow, with a lid on top of it called the Mercy Seat or the Propitiation. Two cherubims on top of it, their, their wings reaching towards another. And God said, I will meet you between the wings of the cherubim. I will speak to you. I will commune with you. And that is basically his throne on earth at that time. And also then in the temple. It was his throne. And he told Moses to make it according to the pattern. Not just make, a, make an Ark of the Covenant or just make a, an altar of incense the way you think. He told him exactly how to make it. Now there's a reason for that. It's because we read in Hebrews and other places that this Ark of the Covenant, this Ark of Testimony, this tabernacle was actually a small replica of what is in heaven. It was a shadow of the things in heaven. So it's very important to understand when we read about this Ark of the Testimony, Ark of the Covenant, the parts of this furnishings in it, they have a meaning. They have an eternal meaning. And their counterparts are in heaven. So it says he is to put it before the testimony. And we read in Revelation eleven nineteen, And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament, or his testimony. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. This word, and we find it other places, this word means a testimony, a witness. It's very close to the word martyr, where you testify of your faith with your life. And we read over and over again, Exodus, that it's not just called the Ark of the Covenant, but Ark of the Testimony. Exodus 25, 16, And thou shalt put into the Ark of the Testament, Mormoni, which I shall give thee. Exodus 25, 21, And thou shalt put the mercy seat above, upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. That's important to know. The testimony is inside the ark, underneath the mercy seat, which is the throne of God. The testimony is the Ten Commandments. God's throne is built upon His righteousness, His holiness, His Ten Commandments. And this was so in earth, but this is also so in heaven, he has not changed. He did not do away with his will, with the testimony of his will of the Ten Commandments. So it, it belonged in the most holy furnishing of the tabernacle, in the most holy place of the tabernacle. Only the high priest could come in once a year to make atonement for the sins of the people with blood. Only him, no one else, except at that time Moses was allowed to. He was the exception. We read about that the ark is to be placed behind the veil of the ark of the testimony. And over and over, it's called the ark of the testimony, 
the veil of the testimony. One place in Numbers 18, 2, it's called the Tabernacle of Witness. God made a covenant. God is a covenant-making God, and he made a covenant with Abraham. It's a binding agreement. He made a covenant with his people after he brought them out of Egypt, out of their captivity, out of their slavery, through the Red Sea. He brought them to Mount Sinai, and he said, I have redeemed you. I have bought you out of slavery. Slavery, you are now my position, possession. You now belong to me. I'm your God, not the gods of Egypt, not another God. I'm your God, and you are my people, and I will bless you. I will protect you. I will guide you. I will lead you. God made himself, uh, the English word, God said, I am promising to take care of you as your God, as long as you will be my people. And this is when they got the testimony. And it is important then to look, what is the first mention of something in the Bible? What is the first mention of the testimony? We always study things by the first mention. You find very important information when you're studying the Bible. We're looking now at Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 through 20. This is when God brought them to Mount Sinai. He said, I'm going to speak to the people, have them sanctify themselves. Don't let them come near the mountain. They will die if they even touch it because God is holy. He was then, he still is. We can't come in his presence, skipping in like it, whatever. We come with, with, with reference. We come today in the New Covenant by the blood of Jesus and his righteousness, not by our own. Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. Exodus 19, verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood on the nether part of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. When you see the throne of God in heaven in Revelation, there's lightnings, there's thunderings, there's voices. It's raw power, raw holiness, undiluted purity, holiness, might, reigning, eternalness. There's no word for it. But so when this poor mountain had the presence of the Almighty God come upon it, the highest throne came down upon that mountain. The one who sits on the throne of eternity, the Most High, that mountain had to be on fire, had to burn, had to shake. Moses said in Hebrews, I exceedingly feared and quaked. It was a fearful sight. God says he's a consuming fire. The people heard him speak audibly. Not just a few people, not just some obscure person who says, oh, God, talk to me, and they start some new religion. No. It was over a million people. They heard God speaking audibly to them. And he spoke to them. We read in Exodus 20, he spoke the Ten Commandments audibly. They heard the Ten Commandments audibly before they had them in tables of stone testimony of God. He spoke. He gave testimony. When you're in court, you have to speak. You have to open your mouth and say what you saw. You're a witness to something for the accusing side. And God spoke and gave witness to himself. He gave testimony to his holiness, to his law, to how we can have relationship with him, to his will. Ten Commandments are the will of God, and they did not change in the New Testament. Jesus only made them more in more depth. Instead of saying, just don't kill, he said, if you hate someone, if you have bitterness and unforgiveness, you're a murderer. And in every way, he, he confirmed the Ten Commandments, the testimony of God. They had the spoken witness, the spoken testimony of God there on that mountain. And then he gave them the written he wrote it down for them. In 
Exodus 31, verse 18. Exodus 31, verse 18. Moses, he calls him up into the mountain. He tells him, gives him the exact measurements of the tabernacle of all of the furnishings. And then in verse 18 we read, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, written with the finger of God. They're not called the two Ten, Command the Ten Commandments here. They're called the tables of testimony, written with the finger of God. There are many who claim that they got something from heaven that is written, that, that they got from heaven. Joseph Smith says he has these stone tablets that he found in a cave. Nobody's ever seen them because they don't exist. But the Ten Commandments, the testimony from heaven, existed and do exist in heaven. These were written with the finger of God. We must imagine this. God himself said, I'm going to write this in tables of stone with my finger so that you will know forever this is a testimony to my will, to my covenant, who I am. And in stone, because stone would last a whole lot longer time than a papyrus. And then we read in chapter 32, verse 15 and 16, as Moses was coming down from the mountain. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other side were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. God cut those stones out the first time. It was his work, and it was his handwriting. You've got handwriting. God has handwriting. He wrote in his own handwriting. His testimony. And we know that Israel rebelled after only three months. They started worshiping a false god. Moses threw those tables down and broke them. And he had to go back again another 40 days. And it says again, he had to cut out the tables himself out of stone. But God wrote again. He wrote his testimony. He wrote with his finger the Ten Commandments for a witness. For a witness. We read in this idea of being a witness. We read in Deuteronomy 31, 26, where God says to Moses, shortly before Moses is to die, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be a witness against thee. Because he told Moses, Moses, you're going to die, and I know this people, they're hard-necked, they're stiff-necked, they're going to turn away from me. Write this law again, put it in the Ark of the Covenant, it will be a witness, it will be a testimony against them, a witness against them. He also told Moses, write a song, sing it. It's called the Song of Moses. You can read it. And he said, teach it to your children and teach them, have them teach their children's children. They will know this song. It will be a song that they sing all the time that is known. And he says, this song will be a witness against them. It will be a witness against them when they fall away because it's a song of the glory of God and all he did for them as a people. God made a covenant with his people on Mount Sinai. It was a covenant that was lasting. It was a covenant that he initiated. It was a covenant that they had to obey to stay in relationship with him. And we read that it was a blood covenant. We read how Moses made a sacrifice and he sprinkled the people with the blood of the sacrifice. That was the old covenant. It was a blood covenant. And we know that a blood covenant is very well known in history. In the American Indians, they used to make a blood covenant. They would, would cut their hand or their wrist and, and, and both and mix their blood to say, we belong together, we will commit to be true to each other, to protect each other and their family. And it was a blood covenant. That was the most binding covenant you could make. And still probably is in, in countries and peoples that do that. God made a blood covenant with his people through the blood of a sacrifice. The new covenant is a better covenant. It's got the blood of Jesus Christ as a sacrifice. But that's another sermon. So let's look at this witness, this idea, this the testimony, the witness. What is a witness to? We're looking... We find
find this word also in Acts 7, verse 34, Acts 7, 34, where Stephen is preaching and he says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. It's called the tabernacle of testimony, tabernacle of witness. What is it a witness about? The Ten Commandments is a witness to the true and living God. There is a God in heaven. And he is a witness that he speaks. It is a witness that he wants relationship. It is a witness that he wants covenant. It is a witness that he came down from his throne in heaven onto Mount Sinai and gave his testimony to his people, the Ten Commandments. It is a witness. Witness also means evidence and proof. Those two tables of stones were something they could hold in their hands. Proof. It is a witness to the will of God. It is a testimony to the will of God. The Ten Commandments is the express will of God. It is a witness against those who do not obey the will of God, the commandments of Lord, the Lord. It is a witness against them, just as in a court of law. It is a witness against those who do not keep his covenant. Just as in a court of law is a witness. We read, I want to look again at about this table of testimony, ark of the testimony that we see in Revelation. Revelation chapter 9. Revelation, excuse me, chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Verse 15. We'll read it in context. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, thou art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that they should give reward unto and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, and the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. So we see this ark of his testament, where his testimony is inside it, in heaven, as well as was on earth, has to do with judgment. Judgment of the wicked and rewards to his servants because they kept his testimony, because they loved his testimony the law of God. We see it's connected in Revelation 15 was the same thing. Revelation chapter 15. Revelation 15, 5 through 8. And after that I looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven. There's a testimony, the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. God's judgment is also an expression of his holiness, of his glory. He is God. He is sovereign. He will reign. And we see this testimony, tabernacle of the testimony in heaven is again related to judgment. Because the Bible says everyone who does not come to Christ and receive his forgiveness, his cleansing, enter into the new covenant, will stand before God's righteous judgment seat. And there is a witness against them. There is a testifier, a testimony against them. And that is the Ten Commandments. That is the law of God. That is the Word of God. 
and every mouth will be stopped and everyone will be guilty if they come to this judgment throne in their own trying to be good enough, trying to have good works, their own religion, what they liked. And it will be a terrible, terrible day. But there is a new covenant. There is the covenant of the New Testament. Jesus is the witness of that new covenant, the faithful witness. And we read in Hebrews chapter 9. Let's look at this. Hebrews chapter 9. I want to read first Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19. It's referring back to what I talked about Moses, God making the first covenant with his people, the blood covenant. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. So the first covenant was sealed with blood. Now we read in Hebrews 9, 11, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, nor by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in, once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through, his, through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So, in the New Covenant, the New Testament, Christ himself is the sacrifice. Christ himself gives his blood, the perfect holy blood, as a lamb without spot or blemish. Christ himself takes his blood not into the temple on earth. He did not go. The temple was still there in Jerusalem when he died. The high priests were still going once a year with a sacrifice to cover the sins of the people, as God had commanded. But Jesus did not take his blood and put it into the most holy place in the temple of, on the earth, in the temple where the throne of God was on earth. He did not go there. It says he went in to the temple that was not made with human hands like the temple in Jerusalem. He went into heaven, into the original temple, the true temple of God, the true tabernacle of God, and he put his blood on that ark of the testimony in heaven where the Ten Commandments of God are the basis of his rule and where our righteousness will never stand, where we have to have the blood of Jesus as our sacrifice. We have to be cleaned and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We have to have his righteousness to even have relationship and covenant with God in the new covenant. But he did. He loved us. He did that. And he's, attained, he's obtained eternal redemption. The, word, the Bible says here that blood of calves cannot cleanse sins. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But Jesus shed his blood for you and I. He shed his blood to save us, to set us free. And we read that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Speaking of Christ, and Jesus Christ, who was the faithful witness, a witness for us, a witness of God, a witness to the truth of this word, and the first begotten from the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us with his blood. Jesus loved you. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he gave his holy, pure blood. That's why he rose from the dead. That's why he went into the holy of holies in heaven, into the ark, to the ark of the testimony, the throne of God, and put his blood there as a covering and a payment for our sins because he loved you, because he loved me. What a covenant. You know, Hebrews chapter 13 says it's an everlasting covenant. You know, the first covenant, it was done away because it wasn't perfect. 
We read that in Hebrews because the blood of, of animals couldn't take away sins. It was just like a band-aid. And it had to be given over and over again. But we read in Revelation 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, from the, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He says, it's the blood of the everlasting covenant, and he is going to make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing. In that new covenant, he gives us a new heart. He changes us. He conforms us to the image of Christ. But he says it's an everlasting covenant. Hebrews chapter 6. The last passage I want to look at. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. Hebrews 6, verse 13. Talking about this new covenant, the blood of this new covenant. He says, For when God was made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, multiplying I will multiply thee, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of, the pro heirs of promise the immutability of his promise and counsel, confirmed it with an oath, that by two impossible things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that veil. He says, in this everlasting covenant, God, in the new covenant, as well as the old, but the new, he says, I want you to know, I want to bless you, I want you to be my people, I want to be your God, and I will confirm it with an oath. You know, God cannot lie. That's one thing he cannot do and he will not do. He cannot lie. If he says he will do something, he will do it. He confirmed it with an oath. And he says, this covenant is a strong consolation for you and I. We have fled for refuse. Fled for refuge from the wrath of God, the judgment of God that we justly deserve. And we have hope. We have faith in what Christ did on the cross. We have faith in the new covenant that promised us forgiveness and eternal life with him and eternal inheritance. Verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. That is a beautiful picture. We live in a time, even in this corona time, everything is shaking. Everything is in question. We don't know what to hold on to. He says, you have an anchor for your soul. You picture an anchor, you know, with a rope. That anchor is not in the ocean. That anchor is not being held by some person. That anchor, if you think of that anchor, it goes in to heaven behind the veil, into the Holy of Holies, is anchored on the throne of God, is anchored on the mercy seat of God. It's behind the veil. What was behind the veil? It was the Ark of the Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God. And that is where our anchor is. And it is in heaven. It's not anchored in a temple that's been torn down. It's anchored in an eternal temple, an eternal heaven, an eternal throne that no one can depose God from, that no one can even attack God from, that you and I are sure and secure. It is a sure salvation. You have an anchor for your soul today, no matter what is happening in this world or whatever will happen. We have an anchor for our soul because it is anchored in the testimony of God, in the throne of God in heaven in Christ Jesus' throne in heaven. Hallelujah. So he does not want us to live in fear. He wants us to have this anchor that we hold on to. And he is coming back for his people. He will fulfill his promise. We will see him again in heaven. He will come back if we belong to him, if we are a part of that new covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. How do you do that? You say, the law, the testimony of God, the Ten Commandments witness against me. I am guilty. I am a sinner. 
I am a sinner in my heart, in my mind. I cannot change my nature, but I repent. I want to turn from that and repent and believe. I put my trust in Jesus Christ. He is the new covenant. His blood. I take, I believe and commit myself to him that he will cleanse me by his blood. What he did on the cross is my salvation. I want to follow him. I want to know him. I want to belong to him. You do that and you become a child of God. He cleanses you with his blood. You become a part of his new covenant and you're born again into the kingdom of God. And this anchor is then yours. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the sure hope we have in the blood of Jesus, in his death, blood, and resurrection. Lord, I thank you that we have a God in heaven who is alive, who has given us a testimony in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, testimony of his will, of his being, of his love in Jesus Christ as well as in his word. Father, I pray that we would just hold fast to that anchor and know the anchor will hold, the anchor is sure because it's anchored in your throne in heaven. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Write us at New Beginnings International Church if you would like to know more about Christ and this anchor for your soul.